Hello, my dear 1000 PS TV viewers. KTM has a new travel horse in the stable, the 890 SMT, but KTM also has a tried and tested good travel model in its range, the 1290 Super Adventure S. The question is, which one is faster to travel on? Dear Gregor, and I will find out which of the two is the faster one. And I think we've done a pretty good job because we're not asking which one is better to travel with. I had it as a long-term test bike, I think four or five years ago. I was thrilled, the current model, I'm thrilled again. And so the question is, which one is faster to travel it's with? It's a funny question, isn't it? Sorry for interjecting, but who asks this question? Maybe there are a few sporty pilots out there who are still concerned about speed when traveling. Let us know in the comments, what do you think? Can speeding and traveling be combined? Or is it always a case of wanting to see something of the landscape when touring? I can do a bit of both. KTM ready to race. It says it on the key tags, so they make no secret of it. And I actually believe that people want to be able to ride fast in very tight twisties on wide winding roads, even on the highway. Which has to be said, if you exclude the post-90 adventure models with the 21-inch front wheels, where you can say, okay, that's off-road oriented, although there are quite a few differences between them, as we will come to in a moment, in price, horsepower, weight, they are the closest related KTM touring motorcycles. And that's why, funny comparison, some might say, but maybe to put it in perspective, if someone is really bare and says, I don't know whether I'd rather take a 250 kilo touring motorcycle or a 200 kilo touring motorcycle, here's the answer in the video. Maybe we'll get straight to the technical data first of all, so that we know our way around. In the technical data, it's already addressed that the two bikes are of course strikingly different. We have 105 horsepower at 8,000 RPM and 105 Newton meters at 6.5, we have 160 horsepower, so 55 more at 8,750. And uh, we have an incredible uh, 138 Newton meter of torque at 657. Um, so these 250 RPM more, where the Super Adventure S at has its highest torque K negligible, uh, it accelerates this V2 with 1300 cubic centimeter displacement. I am still amazed at how nimble this bike really is. The weight is 246 kilos. We weighed it on the scales and there is the difference, 205 kilos, 41 kilos difference, a little less power. But it has to be said, the Super Adventure S1290 is as nimble as it is. And I rode that one first and then this one, and then I actually found it nimble again uh, for its class. Uh, yeah, it's so agile and nimble. Uh, the two or five kilos, yes, that's not much. I almost thought she would have less and we have normal road tires. 120, 70, 17 at the front, 180, 55, 17 at the rear. And on the Super Adventure S, we have 120, 70, 19 at the front and 170, 60, 17 at the rear. So I would say that the handling is probably also due to the tires, a narrower one at the rear, a slightly larger one at the front. Of course, that's noticeable compared to this one. Um, what do you I say? I think it will really be a combination of the weight, the 40 kilos more you have to move here, as well as the larger tires. I fully agree with your first statement, so to speak. I always think to myself when I get on a super adventure, it's amazing how easy it is to move 160 horsepower and 250 kilograms around. 
it's so effortless. It's only when you're already a bit fast on the road, when you've reached a bit uh, higher speeds and then have fast turns that I find the Super Adventure needs a bit more power on the handlebars or a stronger impulse with the body so that you can probably also use the higher circular forces and then this slightly heavier mass to make quick changes of direction. You noticeably need a bit more strength. I also think that compared to some other touring enduro bikes, the BMW GS or Multistrada are now the top dogs in the big enduro bike segment. And I can just see that they are even better at staying agile at higher speeds. The Super Adventure needs a little more power, but is still fully within the acceptable range and above all offers very insane stability. I think even at high speeds, and as you said, there's a, there's a big difference in terms of riding performance, in terms of feeling in the saddle. Um, it's incredibly agile. It practically tips into the bend on its own. You almost have to catch it. And the engine is also much more lively in terms of its characteristics, a little more revvy. And here it just feels, I think, like a fat V8, like driving a fat V8 car. And this is more like a snappy Japanese six cylinder that revs and just wants to be driven in a sporty way. So from a big American V8 to a big Austrian V2, right? And here it's actually a V2 and that's a pure two cylinder with fewer cubic centimeters, actually the 889. But as you've just mentioned, I think you're right, the sportiness is also a bit more given by the seating position. I can't adjust the seat height of the 860. It's a one-piece seat. I have a two-part seat and can increase it from 849 to 869. So I'll just say that the big one can be customized even more. I also have a height adjustable windshield on the big one. I also now have, if we go briefly into the electronics, both super features. So it has AMU and ride by wire. It has lean angle dependent traction control on both. It has cornering ABS, but it only has electronically adjustable suspension on the big one. It's called SAT. It's WP KTM's own system. Works perfectly. You can adjust it just like that, but I have ride mode on both. And yes, I also have the adaptive cruise control on the big one as standard. That means it automatically maintains the distance to the vehicle in front based on radar. So yes, we already said that at the beginning. The KTM definitely has the better touring engine with cruise control for longer stages. Cruise control is then available as an option and is also included in the tech pack. This is then optionally available and is also included in the tech pack. We'll get to those a little later. Gregor, I'd like to talk about the brakes because we have the 320 series discs, Brembo system just for curves, but I've already mentioned that they work really well. And here we only have the Ches Juan or Jot Juan, I don't know. So I always say Ches Juan. I think I've already asked Carlos, our Spanish colleague, well, Ches Juan, yes, of course. But however you pronounce it, it was bought from Brembo anyway, and I say it's very good too, isn't it? And dimensions are almost identical, uh, 320, uh, double discs on both front uh, differences are only in seven millimeter so 260 rear disc on the 890 SMT uh, and a 267 rear disc on the 1290 otherwise the pistons are the same uh, both also have radial attachments so they are very similar yeah I think they've simply gone in the right direction again with the SMT sporty riding was uh, I think priority number one. I think it bites from the very first millimeter of actuation of the hand lever, the brake lever. And with the 1290 Super Adventure, I think it's quite easy to get into the braking zone. It takes a little bit longer on the lever. The whole thing grips a little more gently. But if you then pull firmly, then it also decelerates properly. I was also able to test it today because at 11 o'clock in the morning, which is quite unusual, I thought the game was already over. Suddenly a deer and a small fawn jumped onto the road behind me at around 100 km per hour. The fawn crashed into the road in fright, lying on the asphalt in front of me. I had to brake hard, but it came off easily, and I'm glad that the brakes worked so well. Um, could I come to the conclusion of the whole thing for me now? Because I was already past the deer, because I could travel faster with the SMT. Uh, I was just up front and rode the SMT, and I just have to honestly say, as you rightly say, in my opinion anyway, Everything just feels sportier with it, uh, simply faster and only 105 horsepower versus 160. I have to be honest, uh, 41 kilo difference does seem to have an effect. It doesn't seem a bit less agile to me, although the big one is perhaps more agile on faster bends. I don't want to say more stable because the suspension is also great. But then 
this electronically adjustable suspension has more precision and of course if there's a longer straight section to wind out you're ahead with it you have to shift gears again but we don't have quick shifters as standard on both that's really the ktm philosophy you have to buy it because it's another tech pack all the electronics are included with both and there are differences but the quick shifter alone would be absolutely essential for just under 400 euros for both so if you don't need anything else on the electronics, the sound of the SMT is already quite powerful and good. It's got the Remus exhaust on it, and then the quick shifter really pops in and through. Yes, so the prices might still be interesting. Can we also talk about what's a price difference? I think in Austria, we're looking at a decent amount of in money. In Austria, 23,200. In Germany, I think 21,000. But I'll have a quick look. I don't want to say anything wrong. In Germany, we're at 20,000, pretty much straight ahead. And in Switzerland, it's just under 21,000 for the Super Adventure. And the SMT costs just over 16,000 in Austria. Germany, just under 15,000. And Switzerland, just under 15,000 francs. So over 7,000 difference in Austria. That's quite a lot. In Germany, still 5,000. And in Switzerland, just over 5,000 francs. Clearly a lot of But you money. mainly get comfort and even more electronic features. More electronic features that also benefit comfort again, of course. And now to come to our original question, our counterintuitive one. Which one is faster to travel with? I think you already explained that earlier. But I would round it off like this. As a conclusion, so you could say, I can also imagine that if the route is more spacious and you have the space, the opportunity to give it the beans a bit, then it has the edge. Because as you said, the suspension responds a little more finely. It's also easier at the touch of a button and so on. Simply adjustable. Even during the ride, when you say, now the rough stuff is over, then you can do it again very comfortably. Even the height can be raised and lowered again. Perhaps also good if you're not the greatest pilot. And also the engine, I'm sure, the lively nature of it at the bottom, I think, masks that. Or it feels very strong, this 105 horsepower, the 100 Newton meters. Here, of course, the, the torque punch at low revs, but you don't even get to use this 160 horsepower in the tight twisties. That's why you never really feel it. And that, I think, is the wow experience on the 1290 Super Adventure. If you then have the opportunity, a bit of a longer radius, that you don't just punch the torques out of the hairpin or something, but then you let off the throttle and the thing doesn't stop accelerating, and then even more stability, better wind protection. And I also find that the handling is better. It lends itself even more to being pulled into line with your body, and then it pulls it through very precisely. And on the 890 SMT, I really see myself in the twisties, where I simply push the bike into the radius via the wide handlebars. And the tighter the radius, the better. Because you just want to enjoy the agility and the liveliness of the engine. Um, I think that at uh, high RPMs, especially in direct comparison, the air is a bit raw at some point on the handlebars. Um, and you, you just don't get that punch anymore. And keeps on giving, as they say. The fat v2 that accelerates and accelerates and accelerates yes that's true i've just remembered that uh, thanks to you uh, because so my conclusion would be if you want to get off the highway all the time so just to speak if you want to drive small twisties all the time uh, but long distances uh, why not that works too then the smt supermotor travel is clearly the weapon you should choose uh, because as you just said tight twisties are so easy with it uh, the power is always enough, but if you really want to go somewhere further on the road, then take the big one, then take the fat V2, which is so superior in all respects, you'll probably find the small one fun. Um, but the big one is serious and really good. Yes, and if you don't care about the money, still for the twisties, but there are, as I've already mentioned, these tech packs or quick shifters available on both, a hill hold control system only on the Adventure S. You have to decide for yourself whether you need it, the flickering brake light when you make an emergency stop, also only available on the large one, just under 200 euros. You can take a rally pack with it, the traction control is then nine-way adjustable, throttle grip adjustable. In other words, the response behavior, and you also have the rally mode, and the traction control is also adjustable, throttle response is adjustable, 
and that's called track pack. That means there's a track mode included. So it's actually more in the direction of the road and on the Adventure S, more in the direction of off-road. And yes, if you want to go off-road, there is also an off-road mode. So this is, this is really the, the classic machine, the Adventure Pack, which can also go off-road. It can't and won't do that with road tires. But then if you have these tech packs, the tech pack also includes cruiser control, which it already has as standard. So there are six or seven things in this tech pack that make both of them better. As far as I'm concerned, what I've already said, the quick shifter is the only thing that is absolutely necessary in our opinion. And apart from that, the price difference between these tech packs is just under 1300 euros for the Adventure S. Just under 950 euros for the SMT. So another 350 euros more for the Adventure S. Uh, but as I said, if the money doesn't matter, take the Adventure S. But Gregor, which one travels faster? I would say it depends on the route. And of course, it always depends on the pilot. Actually, with the Adventure S. Because even if you're faster in the twisties, you'll still be faster on the highway. You'll still be faster on the route with the small one. The journey is the reward. And also because you've already mentioned the tech packs and what we think it would need. Martin, if you could choose one, which one would you pick? I mean, you were more off-road oriented with your helmet. Or are you saying, no, the helmet is just style and actually the 890 SMT and the twisties are the one? I would still take the big one because I'm just under sometimes over three digits in weight. And I need uh, this, as you like to call it, this fat V2. It's absolutely essential for me to be able to conceal my body weight with the engine. And you can plow your way through the twisties with the 105 horsepower anyway. I wore the E2 Schubert. Firstly, because I think it suits this supermoto and adventure bike quite well. It's the successor to the E1 and I think it's a good thing that I took a closer look at it for you because I also had the E1. The E2 has the new helmet shell shape. It's a direct fiber process. It's a glass fiber uh, material reinforced with carbon to improve impact absorption and reduce the weight a little. 1700 grams, that's what I call ready to ride. Uh, when all the accessories are on, uh, I think that fits nowadays. EC2206 is the standard that has to be complied with now. It also uh, requires a firmer helmet shell for it to work. It's just an adventure helmet. And Schubert has specially developed the helmet shield in its own wind tunnel. And I have to say the E1 still had a bit of a flutter. Uh, that's not the case with this one. Uh, I can also adjust it to three different heights anyway. I think you can see it quite well. I have it in this position in the middle, which I think looks best. Uh, everyone can decide how they want it. It's also relatively easy to remove. And of course, I can also open it up. And it has this BJ homologation. That means it's also homologated as a jet helmet. And there you have, the, very amusingly, this red cone. If you push it up, it won't go down. But it also holds without the red cone. It's only absolutely necessary for certification as a jet helmet. And yes, I think the ventilation on the E1 is also better. So now you have a nice big slider, which you can really use well with winter gloves. And I think the chin ventilation has improved about the aeroacoustics. It's always difficult for me to judge that. I didn't think the E1 was bad either. Schubert doesn't necessarily like the C2 being put on the same level as your C5, but it is based on the C5. I think it's, it's fair to say. And that's why it's relatively quiet. What do you think of the C5? Not too loud either, is it? I've used it a few times now in Iceland, in Bosnia, and it's really quiet. I've often used it as a motovlog helmet because it's relatively quiet. The new helmet shell shape that they are now using because the C5 was also a new development after the C4, also because of the new homologation or the test procedure. And now the shape of the helmet no longer fits my strangely shaped oval skull but there are pads that allow you to adjust it a little. There is this individual concept. Very nice that you noticed that. I've definitely bought other interior pads now so that it fits a bit better. And, and I'm just feeling it out to see if it's more suitable for my head. And I'm so focused on the driving when I'm riding fast that I don't have time to think about where it's pinching me anyway.
I also have to say something about the wind protection, obviously worse on the SMT. And with the helmet, I haven't really had any serious turbulence, even with the shield. It must have really paid off that they were in the wind tunnel with it and why I'm taking the liberty of uh, pointing out the relationship with the C5 because the press release does say that the communication system, the SC1, which is already permanently installed, is also on the E2. Your C5 has all this and that. They haven't changed that on the E2. In other words, there is this part in the back with which you can communicate. You just have to plug the microphone into the front. You have three connection options. You have a radio, you have this mesh uh, program, and what else is there for communication? Bluetooth, exactly. And with the mesh, Schubert uses mesh 2.0, which theoretically means an infinite number of participants because they keep connecting themselves from one to the next. In other words, a whole parade could be connected to mesh and that's already inside and therefore also uh, relativizes the weight. In my opinion, it's a good helmet, better than the E1. In any case, it's a funny design. A lot of people who look at it say, how old school is that? And I like that old school design. I really like the fact that the decors are so simple. Schubert worked with Kiska for a length of time. But now I think they're back at the level where the helmets are clearly recognizable as Schubert. I like it. So I like the fact that it's such a vintage design, but I like it. I like it very much. Yeah, glad you like it. That makes me happy, Martin. Do you have anything else to say about the two bikes? So we've talked enough about the helmets. I think we also talked about the bikes enough. They both ride really well because the feet position is good. Uh, that's also what counts, that you sit comfortably on it when you're traveling for a I wanted to say something time. about uh, wind protection. These are the same mounts as on the normal 890 Adventure or 890 Adventure R. This means that you can also fit the higher windshields from these on the 890 SMT. I didn't say beforehand which one I would prefer. I think I would really take the 890 SMT for pure road touring because the freeway stages that I ride can be done quite comfortably on it if you perhaps also order the cruise control. Because it is not an uncomfortable bike in principle, just not as extremely suitable for long distances as the 1290 Super Adventure SS. But I'm still more focused on the country roads, on the twisties, and that's why I want to have maximum fun there, and I'm okay if I have a little less comfort on the highway stage. So I think we've summed it up quite well. Which would you guys take? That's the next question. Let us know in the comments because we've sort of explained to you now what we think can travel faster and which one is better. Tell us if you have one of the two or if you're interested in one, what would be important to you? What's important to you on a bike like these? In any case, please subscribe to our 1000 PS YouTube channel. You'll get all the videos delivered to you free of charge. We also have the videos from the Alpen Masters there, uh, also big fat adventure bikes. Uh, let us yes, surprise you. Masters. Everything is coming soon or is already online. We don't know what will be uh, cut first. Uh, thanks for listening and watching. Um, uh, be sure uh, to give them both a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel and I'll say goodbye. See you soon.